Gospels. Let's learn. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 this morning will be our time in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Didn't the worship team do an awesome job this morning? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, give them an applause. You would all be crapping more if it was me leading worship. So, yeah, you guys have no idea, but um, awesome, awesome team. You would team. more for them. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the Word of God this morning. We're going to see so many of your smiling faces. Well, I mean, I know you're smiling behind those masks there, but uh, 1 Corinthians 15 will be our passage this morning in the Word of God. And I forgot to mention, if you are a kicky this morning, and if you would like to, you can go downstairs to your class. If you'd like to go down there, man, I love Easter. Uh, how many of your families are all decked out this morning together, like matching color coding? All right, that's us the buoys this morning. So my wife made a point to uh, color color match us, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I want to say, good, good, my wife, she uh, decorated all this this morning, and so I got a good one. I got a good one. So you tell her that I said that, all right? You tell her I said that. Yeah. First Corinthians 15. <coughs> So, I grew up in your typical Asian home. I mean, from the very, I mean, it was like your typical, what you see probably in the movies. That was my upbringing. Um, it, it was so, so bad, like it was in every facet, when it came to school, for example. When it came to school, there were, you know, have your, have your grading system, and A was acceptable, B was bad, C was cruddy, D you were dumb, F you were a failure, all right? It, it used to be, my dad would say to me, Michael, you didn't go good grades, you don't come home. You're not my son, okay? And it, it was really like that. I mean, it was the pressure of that. I mean, not only were we like typical Asian fan, but we were also poor growing up. Um, I remember, now you guys remember a picture of these, right? You guys know what these are, all right? So, so I remember being home one day and the fake butter, whatever you want to call it. I would put it on my toast, and then being the good son that I thought I was, I remember just trying to throw it away, right? I mean, I would put it back in the fridge, mom would scold me, I would put it in the trash. Well, one day, my mom saw me throwing it into the trash. She goes, what are you doing? I said, my mom, I'm just throwing this in the trash. She goes, you, why are you wasting? There's more to it than that. In fact, she would then take it, wash it out, and she would stick my lunch in there to take to school. And I would be crying, I'd be so embarrassed. We had no, I didn't, I didn't have a lunchbox, so I'd be carrying my country croc to school for my lunch. And, and, and again, being Asian, she would pack my lunch if, with rice and chicken and all that stuff. All the other kids had sandwiches or whatever. So I'd be the one Asian kid at school. I grew up in Arizona. And I'd be carrying my croc. Other, other kids would be carrying the, you know, their little lunch. And I would look around the lunchroom and they, carried, they had plastic bags and they had these nice Tupperware sets, you know, one component for a sandwich and then you had your, you know, your condiments and all that stuff. And me, being the poor Asian kid, I carried around the big old country croc. And I would look around the lunch table and I'd be like, man, I wish I could have that. And I'd go home and say, mom, dad, like all the other kids, they have these nice little Tupperware lunch bags. How, how come I, I can't have that too? Why? You think money grows on trees? And I'd be like, oh, come on. I mean, it was, it was just the typical Asian upbringing. We eat rice every single day. I had rice three meals a day. It was, you know, that's what life was like. Well, I didn't realize, again, I, I, I knew we were growing up differently, but it really hit me when I was dating Amanda, right? So for those who know, my wife is a Howley. And uh, I remember one night we were, in our dating years, and I went to her parents' house to have dinner with them. And I think this was the first time I had ever had dinner with them, meeting her parents. Little, I was pretty nervous, it was quite uh, nerve-wracking, and I remember after dinner, I said to her mom, um, Ms. Hoffman, Ms. Hoffman, do you, do you mind if I help you wash the dishes? Just, no, no, Mike, you're our guest here this evening, please. We got it, we got it. And so I go to the living room and I begin looking at them washing the dishes. And so, but they weren't washing the dishes. You see, there was this machine below them and off to the side, and they were taking their dirty dishes and sticking it in the drying rack. 
And I'm watching Mrs. Hoffman do that, and I'm thinking, savages. <laughs> These people are disgusting. See, you gotta understand, growing up, we hand washed all of our dishes. And then, after they were rinsed, we stuck them in the drying rack. But then I'm at Amanda's house, and I'm watching her family, I'm thinking, I'm going to throw up. I ate off those dishes. And then I, I tried to just block it out, tried not to make a scene, and then after, you know, they ran, the, they ran it, and, and then I'm like, then it's dessert time. They had run out of forks, and so Miss Hoffman uh, grabs the dishwasher, she goes to the dishwasher, she opens it, pulls out a fork, and she begins to hand it to me, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, no, 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 I, I ain't touching your dirty dishes, woman. I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. I was thinking, well, I'm not going to what are you doing? And I looked at that fork, and it was, it was clean. <laughs> I, and I began, I, and I walked over to the dishwasher, true story, I'm not lying. We're in church now. I know, it's Easter. <laughs> I walked over to the dishwasher, and I saw these settings. I had never looked at the dishwasher. Clean cycle. Extra clean. Ex extra clean. I called my mom that night. Mom, did you did you know that that it's not a drag rack? It, it washes your dishes. Michael, of course I know that. That's for lazy people. We we Asian, we walk, we work how we wash dishes. That's drag rack. And I'm thinking, Mom, you lied to me all these years. I mean, there was more to it than that. Mom, it's not just a dry, I mean, to this day, I am bitter. You ask my wife, I do not wash dishes to this day. I stuff the washing machine. That's what I do. I refuse to wash dishes. Because I am bitter to this day. After all these years, I refuse to wash. But I will graciously and lovingly stuff the washing dishwasher. I didn't realize that there was more to it than that. We're here for Easter this morning. And I don't know what your thoughts are in regards to Easter. You know, some of your faces that are brand new this morning, hey, thank you that you are here. But when it comes to Easter, I feel like there's a misconception on what it means. And so what I want to go over with you this morning in our time together is I want to show you how Easter is so much more than what it seems. I'll show you what I mean. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. I'll read it for us. But in 1 Corinthians 15, we see this beautiful passage that just explores and teaches us the power of what Easter is all about. We'll pick up in verse 3. It says this. For I deliver to you. This is the Apostle Paul writing now. He says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according with the scriptures. Let's stop right there. So this right here is the Easter message. That Jesus Christ, and no doubt you've heard the story before. I mean, if you grew up in America, I mean, if you don't get up in church, but you, you grew up in America, you've heard this before. I mean, you are a sinner. And there's no doubt about that. There's no one here arguing, well, Pastor, I, I don't know about that. I mean, just have you lied before? All right? And if you say, no, I haven't, well, okay, right there, you're a liar, okay? I mean, have you ever sinned before? Absolutely. I mean, no, not a single one of us argue, Pastor, no, no, not me. No, we've all sinned. And because we have sinned, Jesus Christ has died on the cross for your sin and my sin. And that he died, that he was buried in the grave. But we celebrate this day because he didn't stay dead. You see, our Savior, had he stayed dead, there's no reason for us to gather this morning. Because then he is no better than any other prophet. See, all the other prophets, so-called prophets, hey, they're still dead. They're in the grave. Their bodies are there. But what makes Jesus different what makes him God is that he conquered sin and death. He has conquered the grave and he has risen. And thus, we are here this morning and we celebrate this wonderful, beautiful, 
as astronomically awesome truth that Christ is risen. And this is the gospel message. And I would encourage you this morning, if you're here, I don't know the reason what brought you out here this morning. I don't know if you're here because, well, you knew if you didn't come, your mom would call you and say, did you go to church this morning? And you couldn't bear to say no to mama. Maybe you're here this morning because your spouse drug you out of bed. Maybe you're here this morning because, well, something, when you woke up this morning, there's something inside of you. Say, hey, man, you need to get up and go find the church closest to you. I don't know the reason why you're here, but can I tell you this? Jesus loves you. He loves you and he died on the cross for your sins. And he conquered sin and death. You see, we sung a few minutes ago, we sang that chorus about four times. We stand forgiven. Why? Because of the cross. You don't have to live in your sin. You don't have to live with your guilt. You don't have to live with your shame. But rather, you can stand forgiven because of what Christ has done for you on the cross. And the fact that he has risen. If you have never put your faith and trust in Jesus, would you make that wonderful decision today. Because here's the thing. Some of you, I, I have not share anything new with you. You know, Pastor, I hear this every single time I go to Easter service. I hear this every time I go to Christmas Eve service. I hear this. But here's the thing. You know it here. But do you know it here? You know, when it comes to that dishwasher, when it came to that, me trying to throw away that country crock box, I was going to tell you, there's more to it than that. There, there's more to the Easter story than, than just that. Now, now, before I go on, what, what I'm, let me clarify first. When I say there's more to the Easter story than that, what I'm not trying to say is, well, well Jesus died on the cross, he is, rose from the grave, and then now I need to do my part, right? I need to go to church. I need to, I need to be good enough. I need to go to Easter service and check it off my, hey, good thing to do list so I can be good with God. No, 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 no. That's not what I mean. Because the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. What is he saying here in the scriptures? The scriptures are saying, hey, you can't do it on your own. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough. You'll never be good enough for heaven. Because there's one who was good enough. His name was Jesus. And he says, for by grace, by God's sheer grace, you are saved. It's not about you. It's about Jesus and what he has done for you on the cross. So get out of your mind this idea that I have to just be good. If I can just have my good works outweigh my bad works, then I'll be good. No, 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 no. You'll never be good enough. Not a single one of us. Not me, the pastor. Not you. No one. That's why Jesus had to come. Because if you could do it on your own, there'd be no need for Jesus to come. But he had to come. Because you and I could never be good enough to satisfy the wrath of God that Jesus was. Jesus was. But when I say that there's more to the resurrection story than that, I don't mean that you add anything to the gospel. I don't mean that you have to be attained to something. But this is what I mean by it. Look at verse number 5. Look at verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 5 now. It says, after Christ had resurrected, it says, and then he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve. Verse 6. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, or in other words, though, though they are now dead. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. We'll stop right there. Pastor, 
Pastor, what do you mean that there's more to the Easter story than what there is? What I mean by this is when Christ resurrected from the grave, he didn't just automatically shoot up into heaven. No, 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 no. He went to his disciples. He went to other people. He showed himself to them. But he gave them different commandments. He, did, he gave them different instructions. Such as to Peter, go feed my sheep. In other words, go spread the gospel. In other words, go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Go share with other people what I have done. You see, the resurrection power, Jesus didn't just ascend and then poof, good, we're good to go. No, 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 no. The resurrection power is still alive and working today. So this is what I mean by there's more to the story. If you don't believe that Jesus resurrected from the grave, then you have no need to be here. If Christ didn't raise, rise from the grave, then our faith means nothing. That means our Savior is dead. What he said he would do, he did not do. If he did not raise from the grave, then our faith is in vain. You being here is in vain. Then just go live your life how you see fit. Go live your life, how, what, do what you want to do. Be you, do you. You're good to go. Because we're all going to die one day anyway. So might as well live life the way you want to live. Life is meaningless. However, if Christ has risen from the grave, if Christ has indeed conquered sin and death, then that demands a decision. And that decision then demands an action. Christ came. He conquered sin and death. Not so that you would just shrug your shoulders and say, cool. No, not so that you would come to church one day out of the year. No, so that you can just roll over with your life and just do as you please. For those of us who believe in the resurrection, not just here, but I pray here as well, this belief then drives us into action. You see, for those who've accepted the resurrection, we see this all throughout the Bible. That those who came to know the resurrection, their lives were changed. They were no longer the same. You see, when you accept this miracle, you can no longer live your life like anyone and everyone else. Because when you place your faith and trust in this miraculous event, you can no longer be the same. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it would attest to this. It says this. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ has raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What is this verse saying to us? Is that just as we have been, when we are saved, we are, in a sense, symbolically buried with Christ and raised, we have a new life. When something is made new, it means it's no longer what it used to be. It's different. It's changed. And thus, when you come to know the power of the resurrection, you are no longer the same. You see, there's more to the story. Because the resurrection power didn't just end with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. That same power is alive and well today. But have you come to know this wonderful truth for your life? See, the gospel resurrection, it didn't just leave you like you were. It helps you to overcome sin. It transforms your marriage. 
It transforms you. You, you go from being a sinner to a saint. You, you go from being condemned to forgiven. Where you were once living for yourself, now you now pursue Jesus Christ. And it changed. You, can no, you cannot believe and accept and place your faith in the resurrection and be the same. It changes you. See, I what I fear is when we come together for Easter, that for some of us, it's just a tradition, it's just a thing, it's a fad, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that's been ingrained to us as a child that we just get up on April, that April we get up, we go to church, that's a thing to do. No! It is something so much more. A number of years ago, my wife and I she would attest to you, this day is one of the best dates we've ever been on. We, uh, in, at the Blaisdell in town, they had a play called Wicked. Wicked is the prelude to The Wizard of Oz. And we were at the Blaisdell, my wife and I just watching this play, and I don't think I ever laughed that hard before. I mean, it, hurt. it was one of those, you know when you laugh, you just pick it so painful, you just want to stop, but you can't stop. It, it was just one of those. But we got there late, and so when we got there, the programs had been all given out. But luckily, we made it for the beginning, and we found our seats, and then, again, what then came out was just a lot of laughter and a lot of pain in our sides. But they closed the curtain, and my wife and I looked at each other and said, man, that was awesome, right? And so we start, uh, we look around, you know, people are starting to get up, and so we got up as well, and we had a babysitter, so we started walking quickly to the car to get back to, uh, at that point, we only had Madison. And it's, a, it's, it's you ever been to Blaisdell, you know, you gotta walk a ways to get to the parking lot, and then it's kind of dark, right? And so my wife and I were looking around, and it was just her and I just walking towards our car, and we're thinking, score, right? I mean, because typically when you go to events like that, I mean, there's a big traffic jam just to get your car out of there. And so my wife and I, we're, we're, we're just pacing like, oh, let's go, let's go, let's go, baby, we can beat traffic. And we, we get towards our car, and then I, I, all of a sudden I hear this scream at us, there's someone yelling at us, hey, where are you going? Then instinctively, like, it is dark, we're in, a, we're in a parking garage, and then automatically the agent comes out of me, what? <laughs> I mean, I know I ain't big. But I'm Asian, so the, I know the stereotype, all Asians know karate, so I gotta live up to that. So, and so I'm just like, hey, like, I gotta defend my wife here, and he, only, he goes, hey, there's more to the story. We thought we were being geniuses by leaving quickly. It was only intermission. <laughs> and then we like, we thought it was over, so we, we like we felt so dumb, and so we go back and we find our seats, and then we laughed even harder and hurt even more. There was more to the story than we thought. When it comes to Easter, Easter is not just some cute holiday where we go and wear our cute colors. It's not a time where we just come together under normal circumstances and we have a big Easter egg hunt or big festival afterwards. That's not what it's all about. Nothing wrong with those things, per se, but that's not what Easter is. Easter is about a God who loved you, who loved you so much. That he sent his sinless, perfect son to die on the cross for you so that you could be forgiven. And to demonstrate his power, to demonstrate his glory, Christ, three days later, rose from the grave, validating, confirming who he was, the power that was in him. And revealing to you and I, my victory is your victory. And you see, this doesn't leave you yawning and walking away the same. Because if he in fact is risen, if he in fact 
has done what the Bible tells us that he has done. And I don't care what you believe about the Bible. I don't care what you believe or how you accept the words of Jesus. But if he is in fact who he says he is, and he is in fact have done what he said he would do, then you and I better evaluate our lives. Because if you are in Christ this morning, wow, do you realize what you have? That same resurrection power lives in you, believer. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, please know that our gathering is not just a tradition. That we're not just here hanging out, having a good time. No. We're celebrating a wondrous love. A love that you can have as well. How you can be forgiven how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus. The resurrection, it's so much more. There's so much more to it than that. There's more to the story. Let's pray together, shall we?